people within their organization are also complying with their confidentiality obligations because this obligation is not only on the employer or on the IC but with anybody associated with the matter which means any witness both parties etc also have an obligation to maintain confidentiality of the matter it's not that i am the victim and therefore i can do what i want right hello everyone welcome to this episode where we'll be talking about the issues around confidentiality with respect to posh complaints right one of the most biggest reasons i would say why women don't raise complaints because of the fear that their complaint will be leaked their personal information will be leaked and the impact that it will have on their reputation the associated shame etc etc my name is bishan jaswant i'm a partner with siril amarjand lawyer working in the space of employment and labor laws with specialization in matters around anti sexual harassment laws in india with me is lakshmi chat co-founder parity consulting and she works exclusively in the space of diversity and inclusion at the workplace so let's get this started lakshmi absolutely we are talking about confidentiality we're going to be talking about the posh act and very specifically listeners welcome to the posh pod season 2 this episode so bishan confidentiality right and and this is something that we've touched upon in multiple earlier uh, conversations right where the the value of confidentiality the importance of it and the uh, you know and, and i keep using this term the trust and confidence that that is built into the process because of uh, provisions like this interestingly and and you kind of briefly refer to it um the sense of trauma the sense of stigma that is still attached to sexual harassment causes a lot of women to hesitate from reporting uh we've seen that the challenge of sharing information but trusting that that information is going to be kept confidential is also a, a challenge right so why do we and and again kind of going back to uh, multiple conversations that we've had why do we still see sensationalization or why do we still see media picking up on this kind of uh, information why do we still see people actively reaching out to social media to talk about uh, you know their challenges where they're doing it they are probably in violation of the law oh so uh, what is protected under the sexual har- anti sexual harassment act the posh act right mm. information about the respondent and witnesses is protected information about the witnesses uh, is protected respondent and complainant efforts meant to say is protected any information around the inquiry procedure itself is protected and mm-hmm. that's quite broad yeah. so effectively everything to do with the investigation is protected mm-hmm. now but there is a kind of exception that the posh act sets out which is to say that uh, you can without disclosing this information comment on the justice that has been served or disseminated in a particular case right mm-hmm. so that's actually pretty confusing if you ask me because yeah. how are you supposed to talk about the justice disseminated in a particular case if you can't make reference to the names of the respondent or the complainant whose justice are you talking about right so it is no doubt a bit complicated but the legislature recognizes that there is a need to provide some avenue to make a comment about this so mm-hmm. some things which would definitely be permitted are commenting on the number of cases a company has had as an employer mm-hmm. the number of cases that have gone in appeal the number of cases that are pending the number of cases by a woman by a man etc um, are possibly things that an employer can comment about without being too concerned about the consequences mm-hmm. right but anything else if you make a statement about any details that you provide it seems that you would be in violation of the posh act so employers need to be extremely cautious uh, about it and there's also an obligation on employers to ensure that people within their organization are also complying with their confidentiality obligations because this obligation is not only on the employer or on the ic but with anybody associated with the matter mm-hmm. which means any witness both parties etc also have an obligation to main- maintain confidentiality of the matter it's not that i am the victim and therefore i can do what i want right because the victim cannot talk about the respondent uh, either let's say the proceedings are ongoing um, and you say the respondent's name out in public 
there is then a perception of guilt before it's actually happened, etc. So there is an obligation on all parties to maintain confidentiality. And the consequences of, con of breaching confidentiality also, the law doesn't set out in any detail. It actually says it's as per the service rules or as prescribed. And the rules prescribe a very nominal penalty of rupees 5,000, which is to be imposed on a person breaching these obligations, which in the larger scheme of things, considering the consequences of a breach of confidentiality, 5,000 rupees really is nothing. Uh, like with the case of many other Indian laws, the penalties uh, have survived over a long time, which the Posh Act doesn't have that excuse actually because only 10 years old. Mm. But many other employment laws, since I do employment law, have penalties of 50 rupees and 100 rupees, <laughs> which is honestly quite embarrassing. And a lot of this needs a revamp. And similarly, I think there's a revamp needed here as well. But there is still the ability of an employer to prescribe service rules yeah. to say what the punishment should be. And that can be as grave as uh, terminating somebody's employment because as an employee, there's that's the most you have to lose, right? Your job. There's not much else that uh, you can you can yeah. uh, hang the guy for, for it. So yeah. you can lose your job for it and that uh, can be prescribed in the service rule. So that's what's protected. That's what the consequences are. Okay. So, so some practical application, right? And again, coming from cases that that we've handled at uh, Parity. The first one you talked about service law, uh, service rules. Yeah. Um, we work with organizations who have in place the protocol of an NDA. Hmm. So, what the organization does is um, once a complaint is received and the investigating uh, committee is uh, formed, um, everybody involved signs an NDA hmm. and within the NDA is a very clear clause which says that breach of this contract can lead to and an, an the usual legalese which is you know consequences up to and including termination right. of employment right so so organizations are understanding that yes you, we've got to start building in um, th this protection for the organization itself for the for the employer itself as well as for the for the folks concerned now, is that something that maybe we can look at organizations getting into a best practice mode around that regardless of what you have in the employment contract, in the master services agreement, or in any other contractual documentation, just have an NDA at the beginning of every investigation. What do you think? I think it's a good practice, um, but I also don't think it's necessary. Mm. And the reason I say that is because most companies anyway have confidentiality clauses or non-disclosure agreements as part of their routine employment documentation mm -hmm. because apart from the issues around sexual harassment mm -hmm. you are an employer still wants to protect their trade secrets of their course. proprietary information right and all of that intellectual property so for to protect all of that an employer will already have adequate documentation in place yeah. and information around posh will be covered in the various things that are protected under those uh, document sure. right so you don't need a separate uh, document for this plus there are legal obligations anyway right so a contract will say if you breach your confidentiality obligations this will be a breach of contract for which you may be terminated from employment etc and then there is the posh act which sets out obligations in any case so you don't need it because there is enough there but i would still say it's a good practice because at the start of an investigation all the parties involved are reminded yes. of their obligations put down in one place, brief, one two-pager document, not the 12-pager confidentiality agreement or NDA they may have signed at the start of their employment, which they most likely did not read, right? So it's a good idea to do this as a reminder, even though there is probably enough documentation, set it out clearly, a simple one, a good reminder so that they know what the obligations yeah, are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and typically what we found is that it helps from an IC perspective because we kind of launch the, the, the initial conversation, like the first time we meet with a witness or the first time that we meet with anybody where we have that NDA signed and we remind them that one, you know, speak the truth, the whole truth and nothing but mm. the truth, so help you God. And uh, two, the, the service rule breach. And it's a very gentle way of telling them also that, oh, oh civil court over here. So, so yeah. you know, be aware of the consequences. Um, the second uh, area that, uh, again, you know, we've, we've been uh, talking to clients about is uh, relates to something that you just mentioned a few minutes earlier, which is if an investigation finds that the, the uh, complaint is valid hmm. and the IC recommends termination of employment, 
should there be an email from the organization to everybody, to all hands, saying that, you know, such and such person is no longer with the organization and how should that be worded and, you know, is, is there an obligation to do it? Because, you know, you do want to let people know that we don't tolerate this kind of thing. And, and here is an example of us not tolerating it. But at the same time, we do want to stay respectful to everybody in, in the uh, situation. No, so I wouldn't recommend sending out an email to that extent uh, because that's a very blatant breach of your confidentiality obligations. Mm. Unless you are choosing not to talk about the reasons why he has exited. Mm. Right? Uh, nobody can prevent an employer from telling the workforce that so-and-so person has left from so-and-so date. Yeah. You can argue that that is needed for appropriate transitioning of work. It is needed to prevent uh, untoward communication with that individual, mm, uh, etc. Yeah. So, you can justify a communication like that if you don't put out the reasons for the exit. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you start saying that I, he's exited for this reason, then that's a breach of your obligations under the Porsche Act. So, okay. um, you in there's no there is no formal way in which you can get the word out that the person has been fired for sexual harassment. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, this this kind of thing tends to get around in informal ways. Uh, but there is definitely no formal way in which anyone can advise an employer to let employees know uh, yeah. that because it would be a breach of your confidentiality yeah. obligations. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so in most US organizations, they have this concept of with cause and without cause, mm -hmm. right? And, and Indian we as well, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Right. So, so from an employer's perspective, as you very correctly pointed out, maybe this person was in breach of a different policy, not necessarily sexual mm -hmm. harassment, but that person was terminated as a result of breach of contract yeah. with cause. So is that something that, that you know, you can generally allude to the fact that he has left the organization in, um, I'm going to use the term unsavory circumstances without specifying exactly yeah. what is unsavory about those circumstances. That's more likely to pass muster in case it is uh, evaluated for Church. compliance with law. Yeah. 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 So you could allude to the fact that the circumstances of the exit were less than ideal yeah you can allude to that without yeah. going into the details of what okay yeah all right okay and then the third because i i did tell you i have a lot of uh, practical questions for for this section um the third question comes up when especially in the non-urban non-metro and maybe even uh you know the non-middle class women right so, so mm. we're talking about women um, who don't have this level of privilege in uh, Indian society. And uh, cases where the complainant is looking for, reaches out and accepts support from NGOs hmm. to help her, you know, raise the complaint, understand the, the protocol. You can argue that it's the employer's uh, responsibility to ensure that the, the woman understands what she's going to be going through. But from a moral uh, support perspective, right, complainant voluntarily reaches out and, and asks for support. She can't ask a lawyer to come in with her, but can she go ahead and share the circumstances in these kind of um, situations? It's definitely a bit of a gray area, Lakshmi, okay. because by going to a third party with information about it, um, yeah. you could argue if this happens prior to initiating a posh complaint that there is no obligation here, yeah. right? But once the complaint is initiated, um, then in the midst of the investigation, if you choose to approach a third party organization, mm -hmm. then there is a good chance that uh, that will be considered to be a breach of your obligations under the mm -hmm. Bosch Act because there is an ongoing investigation mm -hmm. and you are now talking about the details of that investigation to a third party. Whoever mm -hmm. the third party may be, mm -hmm. they may have the best intentions, maybe an NGO mm -hmm. who help in this space, unlikely to misuse the information, whatever it may be. Yeah. Uh, I would say that once the investigation has started, uh, that makes things a bit difficult. But before the investigation has started, before a complaint has even been filed, mm -hmm. you haven't put the machinery in motion. Mm -hmm. Before that, What's happened to you is up to you how to deal with it. So yeah. I don't think there there would be any issue. Okay. If you want to go out to reach out to them, seek and seek help on what to do. Yeah. That would be perfectly fine. What to do, how to do. Yeah. And and also coming on an ongoing thing, because if I as the complainant have already reached out to an NGO, I have established that sense of um, you know, trust with them mm. and uh, they're willing to guide me. And yeah. and like you said, you know. Uh, we are saying that this is absolutely um, fair and above board uh, in, in all uh, circumstances. 
and then I go back after maybe after the first deposition or after the first cross examination or whatever. I go back and I say, hey, this is what happened. And, and you know, I need a little bit of help in uh, navigating that. We are seeing, honestly, we are seeing that both complainants and respondents are, um, you know, going out and choosing to speak with lawyers uh, pendency of the investigation. And then they come back because the law says can't bring a lawyer into the room with yeah. you. But the law doesn't say you can't retain a personal yeah. lawyer to to help you and guide you. How does that, I mean, with a lawyer, it's different because you know you have the lawyer-client relationship, okay. right? But in a circumstance like this? Yeah, so I think it's very different if it's a lawyer and a non-lawyer. Mm. So you are always entitled to counsel, mm. right? You don't have to be uh, charged with an offense to be able to go to a lawyer. You can always go to a lawyer. There's a lawyer-client privilege, mm. confidentiality obligation that mm. exists. So mm. you won't be breaching law by speaking to your lawyer, mm. but by going to any other party, there will be a third party under the law, under the confidentiality obligations under mm. the act. So those will probably be hit in those situations. So Bishan, quick question for you. Day 45 of the investigation, complainant says, here is a new witness that I want to bring to the table. Mm. And one person on the IC says, oh gosh, this person reports into me. Would that be a conflict of interest? I don't think so. Uh, the reason being that everybody, all parties involved are know that this person reports into the other person. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I would imagine that if a decision is being taken based on the testimony given by that witness, uh, the weight of the IC member, who is the reporting manager, should be given the least weightage of the other members. Okay. So I would I would say that that IC member should not be leading the way to take a decision based on that uh, witness testimony. Okay. They can support it or disagree with it, but they should not be the ones leading the way with that decision is what I would say. Excellent. And another reason why you should have more members on the IC than absolutely stipulated. Okay. All right. So next set of circumstances, right? And and uh, this is related to employer responsibility. So um, when you and I talk about situations where uh, there is a complexity of redressal in the sense that complainant respondent don't don't both work for the same organization, mm -hmm. and uh, we said there might be a situation where the complaint is investigated by the IC, not necessarily. Um, of the complainant's employer, right, yeah. by a different IC. Can the complainant at that point in time say, hey, I'm okay with, you know, having somebody take this up, but I don't want to go there all alone because he will have all of these people who are from his organization. I want somebody to come with me. So the, can the employer then say, you know, okay, the HR person will, will come with you or somebody will come with you. And then what happens to confidentiality? So the law allows in cases of misconduct, normal mm -hmm. misconduct, the POSH Act doesn't talk about who can accompany you. It's clear a lawyer cannot accompany you. But the POSH Act doesn't talk about who else can accompany you or not. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, but uh, you can see that there are situations in the POSH Act where somebody else can file a complaint on your behalf, sure. like when there is a physical mental incapacity, which then means the law is envisaging a situation where somebody else can be involved on your behalf. Mm. So if you extend that logic to situations where uh, an employer permits, let's say, a complainant or a respondent to have someone accompany them, not lawyer, have some, someone accompany them as part of the hearing, the same obligations that would apply to someone filing on your behalf would apply to them as well. Okay. So they are now part of the hearing. All the confidentiality obligations under the law would apply to uh, them as well equally. Mm. And so that's how you would uh, see this situation. Mm. And then continuing with the employer role, responsibility, obligations and stuff like that, there's also a mandate in the act which says if a woman chooses to go file a complaint with the cops at the same time or parallel to her, you know, um, internal complaint, the employer is mandated to support the woman in doing that. Yeah. Right. What is the obligation or what is the responsibility of the employer if the cops turn around and say, hey, we know because she told us that there is a complaint internally that you are investigating, give us the papers. Yeah, so uh, the position of this actually is quite clear. And this is not just to do with when the woman goes to cops, but it's possible that a matter gets appealed before a civil court and a court is determining whether the process is done correctly or not. So whether it's before the police authorities or before the courts, there are, there are procedures under the CRPC, which is the Criminal Procedure Code, which mandates that when authorities, cops or courts, ask for documents, 
there is an obligation to provide them. Mm. Section 91 of the CRPC is what, what it is, I think. Mm. So that will trump your obligations to maintain confidentiality because there is an obligation to now give documents to authorities who are asking for it. Not to the world, mm. but to these limited authorities. And this has also been discussed in specific by courts, right? To say in the context of POSH, not generally in the context of uh, Section 91 that I was referring to where there is an obligation to provide documents sort for. In the context of POSH, so it's quite clear that when there is an when documents are sought pursuant to an investigation by the police or court proceedings there is an obligation then to disclose those uh, documents to the courts and cops because there is an implied inherent responsibility on those authorities to maintain confidentiality yeah. of those yeah. that's the logic for why it is permitted okay all right and um you know, when you have that, I mean, you, you talked about the authorities. So there are very specific appropriate authorities to whom the employer has to hand over the information uh, requested, right? Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about confidentiality and, and the bigger picture over here, where uh, perhaps there is a situation where there is an investigative journalist who's kind of glommed on that something like this is going on, and that person is in fact investigating uh, you know, the, the situation. And typically, it's a celebrity uh, involved and stuff like that. Um, and parallelly, you do have a journalistic endeavor to do a certain level of fact checking. Hmm. So what if somebody calls the employer and says, you know, I'm speaking from such and such media organization, we are investigating this story, which has come to our listing, would you have any comments to make? No comment. No comment. Okay. Because any details you give about the investigation procedure mm. uh, would be a breach of your confidentiality obligations. Maybe it would be okay to give limited information such as an ongoing investigation is there and we cannot comment about it at this point of time. Maybe mm. confirming the fact that there is an investigation may not be a breach. But that's also debatable because by confirming it or effectively saying yeah. that the parties are A and B. So yeah. um, I would recommend that employers make no comment in those situations at all. Interesting, interesting. Always, Bishan, learning something new, something different, something useful. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope, uh, listeners, that you found this uh, useful as well. Um, if you did or if you didn't, uh, do reach out to us, share your disagreements, ask your questions, and for sure, comment, because we'd love to hear from you. So like and subscribe. We, we'd really appreciate your subscription. And thank you as always. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.